Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us for this webinar on aligning university investments with carbon reduction goals in the UK through fossil fuel divestment. My name is Nicole Harmon. I'm a program manager with the Intentional Endowments Network, and I'm very pleased to have with me three great panelists to share their experience on this topic today. During this webinar, we'll be hearing from Louise Ryan, Deputy Chief Financial Officer at Trinity College Dublin, John Lewis, the Dean of Knowledge Exchange and Director of the Durham Energy Institute at Durham University, and Sean Ferguson, Trust Executive for Ashton Trust, Mark Leonard Trust, and JJ Charitable Trust, three of the Sansbury Family Charitable Trusts. After our panelists' presentations, we'll spend the remainder of the hour in dialogue responding to your questions. So please enter your questions throughout the presentation in the chat function of the control panel at any time, and we'll try to get to as many of them as possible. And please note that when submitting questions, they will be asked anonymously. The webinar is being recorded. It will be distributed to all registrants by email and will also be available on our website shortly after it's completed. So you can refer back to this conversation and share it with others. And we will also make slides available upon request. So just briefly before we dive in, for those of you that aren't familiar with the Intentional Endowments Network, we are a nonprofit collaborative peer learning network with the goal of supporting endowments and enhancing performance by aligning investments with institutional mission, values, and sustainability goals. And we do this in a variety of ways, including hosting in-person forums and events, facilitating peer networking, curating useful resources on sustainable investing opportunities, and providing educational venues such as webinars like this one. And I'd also like to take a moment to share an opportunity to highlight fossil fuel divestment commitments at the Global Climate Action Summit that is being organized by California Governor Jerry Brown this coming September. At the summit, the Divest Invest Network will celebrate recent commitments to divest invest across a range of sectors. And in the context of subnational leadership, Divest Invest is looking to highlight new divestment commitments and announcements by colleges and universities. So this is a meaningful opportunity for any school that is planning on or close to a decision on divesting from fossil fuels due to the coordinated publicity push and press event organized by the Divest Invest Network. So with that, we encourage you to stay engaged in these conversations after today's webinar. More information on IEN is available on our website. You can see a link on this slide, or you are welcome to reach out to us at any time. My email is also showing here. And now I will turn it over to Sean. Hello, everyone. Divest Invest is now a global and important movement of investors. More than $6 trillion of assets under management have been pledged to divest and divest invest. These include foundations, faith groups, pension funds, sovereign wealth funds, as well as universities. And just to be clear what it is, it's the commitment to sell investments in fossil fuel companies and invest in those companies and funds that are providing solutions to climate change, sustainable energy, afforestation, zero carbon transport, for example. So Divest Invest is about moving money from companies causing climate change to companies that will help to solve it and profit from doing so. It's also about increasing the number, the size and the type of investment products that are available to investors who want to protect themselves from the financial risks of climate change and that will increase the flow of capital to climate solutions. It's also, and this is really important, a very powerful symbol that we need to hasten the end of the fossil fuel era to reach a zero carbon economy. And this gives policymakers the headroom they need to make appropriate decisions. As Nicole said, I work for the Ashton Trust, the Mark Leonard Trust and the JJ Charitable Trust. Those are three trusts which, which are amongst the 17 of the Sainsbury Family Charitable Trusts. Those three trusts have been very active in the Divest Invest movement for several years. They have divested and invested 
it hasn't come at a financial cost. In fact, for them, it's been financially beneficial. Next slide, please, Nicole. On the basis of robust evidence, we consider there's a compelling case for foundations and universities and pension funds and others to divest from fossil fuels and invest in climate solutions. And that case is financial as well as ethical. Now, the fossil fuel era will end this century. The question is, will it end in time? Now, fossil fuels have brought great human development for a minority, and we must bear that in mind. And now we have an opportunity within a very narrow window of time for transformation that uses the knowledge and the technology and the wealth made possible by fossil fuels to move beyond them and in ways that avoid the worst of climate change, as well as the worst economic and financial damage. Now, it's clear that we're already transitioning away from fossil fuels, and renewable energy is in many instances as com cost competitive or cheaper than fossil fuels, and if it isn't already, it soon will be. Next slide, please. And whether or not we limit climate change to two degrees or less than two degrees as we wish to under the Paris Agreement, whether or not we do that, we'll continue to see huge losses in the fossil fuel sector as we make this inevitable transition away from fossil fuels towards the renewable energy economy. However, if we don't limit climate change to two degrees or less, we will see huge losses across all sectors of the economy. And those losses can't be hedged. Alongside that, if you take account of the fact there's growing evidence that divesting does not affect your returns in the short term and is likely to protect them in the long term, it becomes a no risk option for investors. Now, the fossil fuel industry does not lead the market anymore, it lags it. We surveyed UK fund managers to find out more about this. 89 and 30 of the main fund managers replied to this survey, including the likes of BlackRock, Aviva. 89% of them think that climate change risks, such as increasing regulation, litigation, or competition from renewable energy, will significantly impact the valuations of the oil and gas companies in the next five years. In fact, 90% of them said so just marginally more, expected that at least one of these risks may impact significantly within two years. So the upshot is clear. It makes sense now to shift capital from fossil fuels to sectors which are growing in the clean economy. And it makes sense financially and in terms of our fiduciary duty to invest in ways that support the global target to limit climate change to less than two degrees. And the slide that's, that's on the screen now shows just the additional investment that's needed to make that happen. So there's an opportunity cost if we remain investors in sectors that aren't contributing to a timely transition to a zero carbon economy. Now universities, to some extent like ourselves as foundations, have a very special role in ensuring that we deliver an energy transition in time. As you know, universities have been shaping societies for nearly a thousand years. They are institutions which expect to grow human knowledge and will shape the future and exist in the future in perpetuity, no doubt. And generally, society looks up to and trust universities and understands that they work with the best of knowledge for universal good. At the same time, it's evident that universities are under many competing priorities and not least funding. For these reasons, how universities invest sends a really powerful signal to the rest of society. It establishes new social norms, new norms, for investing. Next slide, please, Nicole. 
as I said at the start, um, in my introduction, Divest Invest and divestment is, is one of the biggest social movements that we've ever witnessed. And it, it's interesting, this is, this is a movement of investors. So these, are, these are, are, are individuals with a considerable amount of agency in society. It's important that we see the scale of this movement change and not least to stimulate new products in the marketplace. At the moment, we know that fund managers are not yet incorporating the risks that they understand from the transition to a zero carbon economy into the products that they offer investors. We need more investors, especially universities, to use to use their weight in society, to use their agency as asset, as asset owners, to request that new, new products are brought onto the marketplace and open up that marketplace to other investors too. Final slide, please, Nicole. This is, our, this is um, the current level of commitments to divest invest. As Nicole said, there will be a new, uh, we'll be updating this figure to launch just before the Global Climate Action Summit in California later this year with a new report. This is an open invitation to all organisations who are participating in this to join us in the next announcement. It's now my great pleasure to hand over to John at Durham University. Thank you. Uh, this is John Glues from Durham University, and in particular uh, from Durham Energy Institute. Uh, I'll talk to you today about the process involved in the uh, divestment uh, decision at Durham University and how that played out over a period of, of two years. But before doing that, I will spend just a few moments introducing myself. Um, it's important for me to uh, reveal at this point that up until nine years ago, I was part of the petroleum industry. But it was a growing recognition that uh, uh, in terms of uh, the impact on the climate that we needed to do something about it, as you've just heard uh, in the previous uh, talk from Sean. And so part of my own uh, revelation or uh, epiphany, if you will, was to move to Durham and ultimately to lead the Durham Energy Institute, where we are researching a huge number of processes and possibilities, uh, which we hope will form part of the future energy portfolio for the globe. Uh, could I have the next slide, please? What I have for you today are, <clears throat> are really just three more slides. One of the timeline, which we'll describe in some detail, uh, the process which Durham University went through, and then just looking at the three components that we did uh, at the same time. We thought it important, and you'll see, you'll see why in a minute, not simply to consider the question that was posed to us from some of our students, but put our own house in order as well. And then what I'll do in the final slide is just to look at some of the outcomes from the process as it stands. So if I can have the next slide, please. I, I just pointed out before we began the webinar that the timeline at the bottom is a little fuzzy on the uh, ones you can see on the screen. It runs for two years from May of 2016 until the present day, uh, July 2018. And it began when our vice chancellor at Durham University was asked by the student body to consider uh, divestment. In fact, this was the first formal uh, request we'd had from our student body, though we can probably trace some uh, initial discussions back, uh, backwards a year or two from that. And within a few weeks, we had the first meeting between Durham University itself and the student bodies. And at that point, uh, the vice chancellor and his team made a commitment that they would uh, listen very carefully uh, to what the students were saying, would create a commission which included the student bodies, uh, student body I should say, and uh, take uh, the process through to completion. Uh, the student body, along with uh, a number of people, selected 
fairly widely across the university from a whole array of different disciplines, uh, from law to uh, earth sciences and engineering and so on, met for the first time about this time, mid-July of 2016, or was formed at that point, and our first meeting followed shortly thereafter. What we were keen to do is uh, understand the total impact that divestment might bring to the university. Uh, we have, of course, and this was mentioned by Sean, a whole array of different linkages uh, through research, through employment, through wider student experience with different parts of the energy industry, including a sizable portion of a uh, number of relationships with the petroleum sector. And so understanding the impact um, th that might occur in terms of employability of our students, the wider student experience, impact on research income uh, played an important part in the, the Commission's uh, deliberations. One of the early things we did, though, was set a, <clears throat> a simple questionnaire, uh, which was uh, distributed widely, not just within the university, uh, but um, anyone who uh, chose to uh, log in and examine two questions. Uh, did the recipients or did the uh, uh, people who picked up the link wish the university to divest of its investment? Uh, and uh, should we be working at all with the, um, with the petroleum companies? As one might imagine, since it's part of effectively a self-elected piece, there was a very strong uh, desire from those who responded to the questionnaire uh, to uh, divest. There was also a, a, a less strong, but still a better than 50% chance of really cutting all ties. Uh, this further was considered by the uh, commission through a further uh, two commission meetings with lots of work going on in the background uh, and creation of a, a report and risk register. But what we did ahead of that towards the middle of last year, 2017, is discuss the uh, potential intention to divest of uh, fossil fuel extraction company investments with those companies with whom we had the closest ties. These are companies which had sp uh, sponsored uh, research, not necessarily, in fact, fairly frequently, uh, research which went uh, well beyond fossil fuels into aspects such as carbon capture and storage, into geothermal energy and uh, wind energy and so on, and asked their opinions. Uh, to our surprise, in a way, uh, we received support from each of the four companies with whom we spoke, uh, and there is clear recognition amongst those companies at least, that as you heard from Sean, uh, there is a limited time frame to be able to use uh, fossil fuels uh, because of the impact on climate change. And many of these companies at various different paces are moving towards the same end. And it's as uh, Sean said, it's the pace of change we need to be uh, um, most aggressive with, uh, the faster the better. We put together a risk register towards the end of uh, July last year and then um, documented and put together presentations which would be considered by the University Executive Committee and the University Council. That's the Management Committee and, if you like, the, the overseeing um, uh, process, which is the University Council. Those were fairly lengthy periods are occupying about six months or so, uh, during which time uh, we got many questions coming back to us. Um, and at one point, and this is rather unfortunate, uh, we had a, a People and Planet, that's one of the organizations which has been pushing for the change, uh, uh, made a demonstration uh, when uh, there was a, an opportunity to quiz an oil industry expert who happened to be in the university. Uh, there we go. And as a consequence, just ahead of the decision, uh, sorry, just ahead of the release of the decision, which was to divest, uh, someone leaked the information. 
again rather unfortunate but the all the press releases were ready and we were able to um uh bring those forward a couple of days and demonstrate to the world that uh, durham university had indeed agreed to divest its fossil fuels there was a bonus from that which uh, surprised me a little and i will talk of uh, when we look at the next slide if i may please so I mentioned when we started this uh, webinar that <clears throat> there were three processes going on in parallel here. I've talked you through the divestment commission process, but we're also careful that, that you know, I, I think Sean said one thing which I'll probably uh, disagree with, uh, and that was the companies causing climate change. I would suggest that every one of us, nearly every one of us on the planet uh, is um, also guilty of the same process we are of course end users of that energy and so we were quite clear we needed to do two things one was to act in the same way that we were recommending the university act and that was to decarbonize the university's estate uh, where do we buy our power from do we use gas what are our emissions like how are we meeting our commitment to lower our carbon footprint uh, and we put together with um, some uh, external help a program which would lead to a zero carbon university estate uh, we have in the last few weeks in fact since this um, webinar was first set up uh, got endorsement from the university executive to take that forward and begin immediately uh, as sean said the process of change uh, requires some uh, uh, it is not straightforward and there are some risks which will have financial consequences but that will go forward the second piece, and coming from the industry, I was particularly keen that we um, were upfront with this, was to work with industry to help it change from oil to more um, to low carbon energy future. And by way of example, my transition from uh, the energy industry into academia was supported by a company called Dong, Danish Oil and Natural Gas. Uh, those of you who are aware may be aware that Dong has recently become Ørsted. Uh, it has moved from being an oil and gas company to entirely being an offshore wind company. I can't pretend that Durham has driven them along that light, road, rather, but we have helped them along the journey, providing the sort of research and support, direct research to support their operations, uh, optimize their extraction of energy from wind which has allowed them to make that transition rather more quickly and i'm for one i'm certainly keen that it's the process we continue uh, with other companies indeed we are doing just that and so if i can just look at the outcomes on the final slide so one and the most delightful if you like uh, divestment bonus was that uh, one of the major companies with whom we spoke once the ceo was told that uh, we had made a decision to uh, divest of any fossil fuel stocks we held uh, that uh, we must continue to work with durham university and help them and help ourselves develop our renewables program they weren't giving up immediately on oil and gas but they recognized the direction of travel and continue to wish to work with us. Um, to be honest, I rather expected a, a shrug of the shoulders. The second point I've already mentioned that the Durham University will adopt what we've called decarbonize and we're beginning now. Uh, we've had no observed impact over the past six months or so in our investment value, which backs up what Sean was saying. And it's allowed us to open a whole series of new conversation about energy futures with various stakeholders, including those that provide employment for our, our um, students as they graduate. One thing we do need to be clear about, though, is that the decision to divest of um, uh, shareholdings in fossil fuel extraction companies does not mean that we will not be working with them there was a recent local news item where our archaeologists had been uh, as part of the uh, legal framework around new developments had been asked to do an archaeological study on what could be um, a 
a an open cast coal area and a number of the public thought we should not be doing that but of course uh, that has is a, a side piece which is uh, uh, and it ensures that we understand the archaeology of the area. In terms of reinvestment, uh, the official word from our uh, uh, portfolio managers is that the divested funds sit within the investment portfolio uh, or its endowments and therefore will be recycled uh, within the portfolio into other investments. Um, and uh, that's me done. Thank you. So now, if I may, I'd like to hand over to uh, Louise Ryan uh, from Trinity College Dublin. Thank you, Louise. Thank you, John, and good afternoon, everybody. I'm delighted to be here this afternoon to be able to give you all, um, uh, I suppose, a description of Trinity's divestment journey. Um, the next slide, please, Nicole. Um, I'll start just by giving a very quick overview of Trinity. So Trinity College Dublin, it was founded by Queen Elizabeth I in 1592, and it's Ireland's oldest university. Last year, we celebrated 425 years in existence. Um, Trinity is Ireland's premier university. It's ranked in 104th position by the QS World University Rankings 2018. And we're structured with three faculties, arts, humanities, and social sciences, engineering, maths, and science, and health sciences and three support areas, which are financial services, corporate services and academic services division. We have a city centre campus on some 51 acres and we have in excess of 220,000 square metres of buildings, including beautiful historic architecture and state of the art modern facilities. We've over 17,000 registered students from 122 countries and we have over 3,000 staff. The university an annual turnover in excess of 350 million euro. Next slide, please. So just to give you a flavour of some of our activities in Trinity, Trinity's library is world famous and the long room houses the Book of Kells, a 9th century medieval manuscript which attracts over a million visitors every year. Trinity's researchers attract over 100 million euro in external funding annually. And we have a global reach with more than 110,000 alumni living in 130 countries. Next slide, please. So onto the Trinity Endowment Fund. It's the oldest and largest among Irish universities, dating back for more than 200 years. And the fund's value has grown from 47 million euro to 188 million euro in the past 20 years, with nearly 2 million euro of new donations added in 2017. The fund makes possible much needed funding for research, teaching support, financial assistance and special, special academic programmes and initiatives and it has distributed 27 million in the last five years. The fund achieved a total return net of management fees of 5.8% in 2017 against a benchmark total return of 4.8%. The fund is performing very well and it has returned 7.5% annualised return over the three years to 2017. Um, next slide please. So just onto the investment philosophy of the Trinity Endowment Fund, the long term objective of the fund is for stability through the establishment of prudent investment strategies. The long term and indeed perpetual nature of the fund provides the capability to withstand higher levels of volatility. And that means we're not overly concerned with short term market volatility. Our current objectives are to support capital growth and maintain our income requirements, which has been challenging in the current prolonged low yield environment. Next slide. And um, this chart asset allocation, it shows the funds actual versus target asset allocation. And you'll see that we're still moving towards our target asset allocation. Following a detailed review, which included our divestment decision, a significant portfolio restructure was, untaken, was undertaken in 2017 with disposal of a large proportion of our bond portfolio, and that was reinvested into ex-fossil fuel equity funds. Further restructuring will be carried out this year with planned investment in international property and infrastructure assets, and that will bring our actual asset allocation in line with the target allocations you see on screen. Next slide, please. So on to Trinity's commitment to divestment. We're very proud of the fact that Trinity is the first university in Ireland to divest from companies whose primary function is the extraction of fossil fuels. Next slide. Um, a number of factors led us to make our decision to divest. 
I suppose, firstly, Trinity seeks to be a leader in sustainability and climate solutions, not only in its investments, but also in its research and in how we operate our campus. We've been awarded a green flag for our campus in recognition of our sustainability initiatives. So divestment very much ties in with our ethos and strategy in this regard. Um, from 2014 onwards, the university had received a number of requests under what's known as freedom of information legislation in Ireland in relation to the investments we held in fossil fuel stocks. And this led to a greater focus on what we were investing in. And it led us to look at emerging SRI and ESG trends in investing and indeed to consider our fiduciary duties. There was also clearly a growing awareness and scrutiny among students and they had a very well managed student campaign which really brought the issue to the fore, which is similar to Durham University, as John mentioned. Um, as part of our divestment deliberations, we met with peer universities to, dis to discuss their positions and approaches, and also with various interest groups. We attended divestment conferences and built up a network of relevant contacts who could provide, adv provide advice to us based on their divestment experience. We also took advice from our own investment managers and internally from our investment committee, our finance committee and the university board. And similar to John and Durham University, the timeline for divestment for Trinity was about two years from initial discussions to actual divestment. Um, next slide, please. So we had a very high level of engagement with our students and other experts during the divestment process. The students fossil free campaign in Trinity, they made a cogent argument for divestment. Student representatives attended and presented to both our investment committee and our finance committee. And during the process of divestment, there was ongoing engagement with the students. We kept them updated on our current thinking and on the research we were doing to try and make an informed decision about divesting. And they were involved right up to the end with the communications plan for publicly announcing Trinity's commitment to fossil fuel divestment. Next slide, please. Um, our investment manager, when we were looking into the divestment, our investment manager researched suitable assets for us, which the fund could invest in. They modelled out various scenarios to assess the potential impact on the fund's income, which is obviously essential to us as it provides financial support for a wide range of specific university activities in perpetuity, as mentioned earlier in the presentation. So when we had made the decision to divest, we also took this opportunity to restructure the, the fund's portfolio, and we did that in early 2017. Um, next slide, please. So whilst it took two years from initial discussions to actually divesting, following Trinity's decision to divest in November 2016, we announced our commitment to divest the following month in December 2016, and we worked closely with our investment manager to oversee the implementation by May 2017. Um, performance has been good to date, and we continue to achieve our required return of 3 to 4% annual real return. Whilst it's too early to gauge performance in any meaningful way following divestment in May 2017, performance has been good, and we continue to monitor performance on a quarterly basis, and we continue to monitor and review the fund's investment strategy. Um, next slide, please. So in terms of the role of universities in the the divest invest movement. I can speak from personal experience to say to you that divestment has been a very positive experience for Trinity. Our decision to divest aligns our investment strategy ethos and it puts the university at the forefront of sustainability and institutional fossil fuel divestment and we think that's extremely important. We developed excellent relationships with student representatives and fossil free society members and the students really engaged in the divestment process in Trinity. And next slide please. So just to finish, um, I've just listed out there five recommendations for organisations considering divestment based on our experience here in Trinity. Firstly, I would say engage with your students, do your research, make a case for divestment and model the financial implications. At Trinity, the income from the endowment fund, it supports a wide, a wide range of activities in the university and we must generate it income on an annual basis into perpetuity for all those activities. So it was very important to us that whatever portfolio changes we made, they would still generate sufficient income for us. Um, once you've done that, make the recommendation and implement. And I suppose one thing um, we would be careful of here is that when you make um, an announcement 
for a commitment to divest and you do implement it, be sure that you're implementing what you committed to. Um, and Trinity has done that and we continue to screen out fossil fuel companies into the future in any future restructurings. And I suppose I couldn't um, understate the benefit to Trinity that divestment has brought to us in terms of our leadership position has been recognised in Ireland. We've increased our profile um, in Ireland and both internationally, I think, as a result of it. And we have much improved relations and engagement with the student representatives in the university. So overall, it has been a very positive experience for Trinity to date. Um, thank you. Back to you, Nicole. Great, thank you so much for those wonderful presentations and for our panelists, if you could go ahead and take yourselves off mute, we'll jump into our questions here. So for the audience, please do continue to type your questions into the chat box and the control panel and we will get to as many as we can. To start us off, Sean, could you talk more about trends in the space and through your work, have you noticed any key drivers, including individuals, groups, or events that lead to college and university divestment? Uh, um, Nicole, do you mean trends in terms of organisations which are making commitments to divest and divest invest? Yes, precisely. So we are in, we're, we're seeing larger scale institutional investors begin to make decisions to divest and divest invest so insurance companies and and as we saw in Ireland two pen, um, sovereign wealth funds um, also last week there was a report published by the one planet working group of sovereign wealth funds which are looking at how to incorporate climate change related financial risk into their endowments so whereas this movement started with foundation or, or started actually on on US campuses in the states and quickly was taken up with foundations actually it's moved very quickly to incorporate faith groups more foundations more universities and then into really mainstream financial institutions in terms of in events which we see stimulate commitments to do this we saw a flurry of activity around the one planet event in Paris last year and I expect we'll see a similar flurry of activity around the Global Climate Action Summit and then again perhaps more at COP24, the next UN uh, climate change event in the autumn and there'll be a follow-up uh, One Planet event in Paris in December next year. Um, we're inviting Storbrand which is a, a Norwegian uh, fund manager and insurance company to speak at the Global Climate Action Summit event and our next Divest Invest commitment um, as well as other I think mainstream organizations so this is this is very quickly moving to be you know major financial institutions which are looking at this so while they're taking account of the financial risk I think they're also responding to what they see as the changing acceptability around um, fossil fuels and climate change and wanting to be I think on the side of history that shows that it will try and make the Paris Agreement happen and happen in time. Right and we have received a lot of questions um, maybe more geared toward Louise and John around the shareholder engagement process and how Generally, there are a lot of proponents of shareholder engagement and how that could potentially be a more effective strategy than fossil fuel divestment. And the audience has a lot of questions about how you responded to those questions if they came up and if you have any thoughts on how others could respond or what you would say would be the most effective strategy in that regard. Um, it's, it's Louise Ryan here. I suppose from our point of view, in terms of shareholders, we really, um, in, in the university context, I mean, we have stakeholders. So for, for us, it was very much an education process for the various committees in the university and also the board of the university and to allay concerns that um, various people would have had on the loss of income that could come from divesting from fossil fuels. So really, there was a lot of work done with our investment managers to make sure we modelled out financial um, financial scenarios and we could give a level of reassurance.
assurance that making this move to fossil free portfolios wouldn't have any material impact on our income and to date that has proven to be the case. So I'm not sure that answers the question specifically about shareholders. But we don't really, in the context of a university, we don't really have shareholders. The same is uh, true for Durham University, the, the process of understanding the potential impact on uh, the university's income were we to go through divestment is really what occupied the the large part of the the timeline uh but it, it you know in the same way that louise has said that we have stakeholders and one of our major stakeholders of course are the students who attend the university and amongst those as the same is true of uh, trinity college trinity college dublin there is a, a, a an overwhelming desire uh, to drive this process through uh, and um what we found uh, it, it's a little early on our investment we haven't seen a, a negative impact for sure in the few months uh, since we made the divestment de decision but what we have found is that our working relationship uh, with for example people and planet which is a, a, a component part of the student body ha has been improved dramatically and we're now uh, working together with them uh, to bring uh, seminars at a local, a national and international level uh, to promote the, the low carbon technologies and not just the technologies, but the social acceptability of uh, those technologies, uh, which is another hurdle which uh, needs to be overcome in some instances. So our, um, in terms of uh, the way in which Louise closed her uh, talk with regard to uh, the impact, it has been very positive indeed. Great, and that that is all very helpful on the stakeholder engagement side of things. I believe, just to clarify, that that question is referring more to owning stock in a fossil fuel company and then participating in an engagement process as a stockholder and working within the company as opposed to divesting the portfolio from the stock itself. I don't know if... Yeah. Nicole, Sean, sorry. Who's first? Louise, do you want to go? Or should I? Um, I uh, no, well, I'll give a very quick response and just say from, from Trinity College's point of view, I suppose the endowment fund is one of a number of things that we manage on a day-to-day -day basis here in financial services. So um, once we made the decision to divest, I don't think we would have the time or the resources or even the expertise, I suppose, necessarily to be engaging with um, oil companies to try and have them change policies. I mean, for, for us, once we made the decision, we, we were divesting. We weren't going to take a sort of a long process of engagement to try and effect change through that way. Uh, John here. Well, we looked at it, certainly from a university perspective, it's exactly as Louise described, that uh, uh, we were not going to engage from the point of view of a uh, shareholder position to try and influence uh, fossil fuel companies, but we do work with them. We've had major funding, as I mentioned earlier, on geothermal energy, carbon capture and storage, and the transitioning of uh, into offshore wind. And so we continue to work with those companies on the alternatives to fossil fuels. We did discuss with People and Planet that that was a, an alternative strategy for individuals to actually purchase shares and make their feelings known at shareholder meetings but uh, as part of a global movement, uh, or certainly a UK movement, uh, People and Planet uh, had made the decision uh, to promote divestment, not active investment. Okay. Nicole, this... Yep, go ahead, John. This is Sean. Hi. This, um, I think the, the question of, of engagement and or divestment and, and investment comes up quite frequently. What we have found is that, first of all, sh shareholder activism is very resource intensive, um, as the other speakers have said. But there is another issue too, in that it's, it's uncertain how it might protect investors from the risks involved in the transition to a zero carbon economy. In addition, shareholders often are asking quite conflicting things from the um, from the fossil fuel companies. For example, some shareholders may be advocating for a company to make a complete transition to become a renewable energy company, which which can be very challenging for companies which are extractive companies and not technology companies. As other shareholders may be seeking that company to wind down and then return value 
to those shareholders. And when we surveyed the fund managers earlier this year, that's exactly that we found that that many fund managers didn't have a clear strategy of what they were trying to achieve through their shareholder engagement with fossil fuel companies. And those that did had very different approaches and were, were asking for things which were potentially conflicting. Great, that's all very helpful, thank you. Um, and could you each talk about what tools may exist for analyzing existing portfolios in various markets to see how performance would be affected along those lines and risk management and what role your advisors played and how you found advisors with the expertise in these divest invest strategies if they weren't already the ones you were using? Um, from, from Trinity's perspective, I suppose, we took the opportunity to do a portfolio restructure when we had made the decision to divest. So um, we, we obviously have public procurement guidelines here. We went out to tender and we received a number of submissions from investment advisors who came in, did presentations, management presentations to us. And based on the types of funds and assets that they were able to access and they were recommending, that's how we selected um, that's how we selected our investments. Um, in terms of monitoring the assets, our investment managers now, we do a quarterly analysis and we're, we're comparing the new funds we're in um, against their benchmarks and also against the previous funds we were in, which did have the fossil fuel companies in them. And we intend to continue to do that into the foreseeable future just to see what kind of differences are emerging um, over time. It's uh, John here. Our, our process was really very similar to that. Uh, there is perhaps one nuance of difference, though, in that when we did the first analysis of our uh, fossil fuel holdings in endowments, they were really de minimis. Uh, they were actually below the level at which uh, the uh, student body had uh, requested we take an interest. Uh, clearly, though, to have simply responded with, we don't really have many holdings, uh, would have been a rather uh, facile and um, uh, ineffective response. So our uh, holdings in fossil fuel companies was really very small indeed. Uh, we have gone through the same sort of process of inviting in, uh, you know, for new investments, um, but it was very small indeed. So I'm not sure um, at the moment uh, that we have uh, a huge amount to say on the performance, but it seems okay. And we've also gotten several questions about implementation. Could you each talk more about what happened after the divestment commitment was made? And specifically, was this integrated into the investment policy? Was there any easy place to start in the portfolio areas that were harder to divest? Other more specific implementation? I, I, John, I can answer this very simply. I haven't been involved in that part of the process. Uh, when I gave the talk, you'll see that my um, my involvement has moved more towards ensuring that we have our own house in order in terms of uh, the university estate. And so uh, that's where I've concentrated. Um, I suppose for, from Trinity's perspective, the implementation was fairly straightforward for us in that it really impacted our equity portfolios. Um, and we, we, we're looking now to make more infrastructure investments. We are focusing on wind energy, solar energy, all the renewables type, um, type investments. I suppose one um, area that was potentially tricky for us was we had a very small holding in diversified alternatives. And once we were sort of really investigating our portfolio to make sure that we had followed through on the commitment to divest, we discovered that there was a very small holding of, um, I think it was derivative products, and we didn't really know what was in them. So we had to divest from them as well, just to be sure that there was no, there was no fossil fuel companies in them or anything like that. We just wanted to be very, very clear that we had in fact divested as we had said we were going to do. But other than that, it was a fairly straightforward process for us because it was, it was mainly the equity portfolio. Um, this is Sean here. Um, the three trusts that I'm involved with here, um, I mean, they started this process several years ago. It was relatively easy um, for them. They were actively managed portfolios and they worked with their fund manager to um, introduce a high ESG screen and to screen out 
those um, the companies which were, which were involved in fossil fuel extraction. In addition, they allocated a proportion of their endowments towards impact investing, which was intended to um, achieve a financial return that matched at least the rest of their endowment. That fund, has, that endowment has been invested in a range of unlisted equities, fund of funds, a few funds and a few direct investments, all with very high impact criteria, both social and environmental impacts. That fund um, is beginning to yield both income and return and is proving to be very successful. So while it took about five years, as you would expect for those sorts of investments, for that return to begin to take shape, it's now proving uh, to be a successful initiative. And along those lines to Louise and John, outside of fossil fuel divestment, has there been any pressure or considerations to divest from other types of companies like tobacco, firearms, tech companies, or other considerations for positive investment that look at environmental, social, and governance factors? Um, and so, go on, go on, Louise. Sorry, just very quickly from Trinity's point of view, we have also divested from tobacco companies and there are no further plans um, at, at present for, for further divestment from particular sectors. And for Durham, uh, long standing that we do not have not invested in uh, tobacco companies or indeed uh, arms armament companies. But it's an interesting question you raise about uh, just, you know, at what level you might be able to invest in various organizations because uh, you know there, there is there's no uh, let's get it right uh, there's no free lunches as it were insofar as if, if you look at for example at wind energy for every major modern turbine it requires some very exotic elements some exotic metals which need to be mined from the earth and are present in extremely low quantities and so you may buy millions of tons to create uh, just the sufficient metal for a single wind turbine. And so you know, we, throughout, um, uh, throughout the portfolio, we do need to start looking at other impacts. And so I was very pleased when Sean talked about the, uh, you know, the environmental cost of, of any investment. We need to look at that very carefully. And I suspect, and I'm just speculating now, that there will be other um, uh, other pressures, correct pressures to uh, take investment very, very carefully in future. Uh, our, um, our student body, our university are much more conscious, perhaps than they were 10 or 20 years ago, about the way in which funds are invested. Hello? Were you saying something, John? No, I've done, I've done okay. finished. <laughs> yeah, sorry, so, my apologies. I think we have time for one final question, and this relates to the overall topic of the webinar. How have any of you seen divestment at your institutions affecting other schools or institutional investors in the UK? And have you been contacted with questions? Have you gotten positive feedback or any backlash from other institutions and what else has come from this peer review and peer learning process that you've each engaged in? I, I, for Durham, it's, it's still quite early days. We have had no negative uh, response whatsoever. Uh, we've had a very uh, positive response on occasion from some of our peer group, um, but it's early days yet, I think. I think that that's similar for Trinity College as well. As I said in my presentation, um, the whole experience has been very, very positive for Trinity in terms of um, sort of our leadership position on this issue being recognised. And we have had no negative feedback at all. We've had plenty of positive feedback and we have had other universities and other organisations um, coming, to, coming to speak with us. The CFO has um, presented at a number of investment conferences since we divested. Um, from fossil fuels. So it, it's been very positive overall. And Sean, do you have anything to add to that? 
so we're dealing with a range of organisations, a range of institutional investors, so other foundations like ourselves, as well as um, other funds and pension funds. Um, we're seeing just a growing interest in this generally, but in particular, guidance on how to do this. So, so the right way to approach investing, which moves capital from, from, from fossil fuel extraction companies, but also invests in a way that's resilient to climate change and incorporates high environmental social governance values. And we're also seeing the fund management community begin to respond to that, which is really, really positive. And we look forward to, to getting more news about that so that we can share that with other investors who want to, um, to contribute towards positive change in society. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much to Sean, John and Louise for this great discussion. And also thank you to all of our participants for joining us this afternoon. And if you have any questions about this webinar or your question wasn't answered, if you have any questions about the work of our participants or other activities happening in the Intentional Endowments Network, please do be in touch. And again, this webinar will be up on our website shortly. So thank you all again and have a great afternoon.